welcome to Furious Driving and today I am out in one of the most eagerly anticipated cars of the last five years. Yeah, this is the new A110 Renault Alpine or Alpine depending how you say it. It's an exciting, beautiful, pretty little sports car and I'm so excited to be at the wheel of one at last. Is it any good? Let's find out. Now a word from our sponsor and on with the review but don't forget to hit like and subscribe first. Proudly sponsored by Diamond Bright, keeping the furious fleet shining. So this is a 2020 Renault Alpine A110, a car which I've built up to almost mythical proportions in my mind because it really does follow the pattern of the original car. Rear engine, lightweight, small displacement, but lots of power to weight ratio and electric handling. I've never driven one and I'm very, very excited to get behind the wheel of this one today. Now you can see how they've taken the original A110 styling and converted it into a new car. This is the Mini and Fiat 500, but done on supercar levels. It's got the same flowing lines, the same small footprint, these same cute but quite aggressive central headlights in the middle there, which are now, I think, indicators and running lights as well. It's an amazing looking car. You, depending on what model you get, you get a 17 or 18 inch wheel, you've got the anodized blue brake calipers, you've even got Alpine cast into the wheel hub. It's a brilliant thing. It's only a two seater of course, because where are you gonna put them? You do have a front trunk down here, so you've got a little bit of luggage in there, but not a lot. And you've got the engine right here behind the, the seats, and you've got a tiny rear trunk at the back. This is definitely a weekend away car, although it's a sports car with Grand Tour pretensions. You're not getting more than a day's worth of luggage in this thing. Even a trip to Sainsbury's will push its boundaries. But that's not what this car is about. This car is about getting on the road and enjoying the road and living for the moment. It's just a fantastic and beautiful, beautiful thing. Now the car's face, the front of it, really is quite intricate. It doesn't look that complex as you first glance, but the longer you look, the more you see. There's a little tiny ridge in the center. It's got these cowls around the center headlights, a stepped out front splitter. There's lots and lots going on there. The exterior was designed by a chap called Dayan Denkov, and I think he did a wonderful design. So many little intricacies. For example, these mirrors, which, which flow up and have multiple curves, and the glass area, which flows around behind the cabin into these air vents. It's really, really beautiful. I love it. Right, this weather is absolutely filthy. So let's climb aboard the car and look around the interior. And I've got to say, it does a good job of feeling rather special the moment you climb into it. The design, the layout, the materials, all goes together to make it feel like it's somewhere you really have arrived in. This really is something a bit special. So we have got a good mixture of carbon fiber, leather, contrast color stitching. We've got the metal effect. In fact, it doesn't feel very metally. Um, bits of uh, trim inserts. We've got the screen here on the dashboard. We've got the big LCD display. And then the doors, even the doors look really quite special. When look at this, we've got the body color insert here at the top. Uh, the satin, um, well, I'm not quite sure what material it is, but satiny, metally looking stuff there. Then we've got the diamond stitched leather pad just here which comes down to points so it's almost radiating like a searchlight in this stitching and of course we've got the French flag logo up here on the top of the door on both sides in fact and that's above a hard plastic side panel leather or possibly leatherette armrest door pull and I can open the door I'm getting wet again now we have like a, a wood effect grain on the speaker grill Oh, it's horrible out there today. Moving back into the car, we've got lots of Alpine or Alpine logo notifications around the vehicle. So the air vents, for example, which have got the carbon fiber surround, have got the A logo here in the center. And there's a cool honeycomb grid behind them, so you can't put marbles down there. The dashboard has a big tea shelf, plenty of room for snackage. This is gonna be a, a fast but fine dining variety of snack. And you can tell we're in a slightly upgraded version from the standard model because we've not got the basic two speaker system. We've got the two focal tweeters up in the top corners. And we've got more carbon fiber here in this shell that surrounds the instrument binnacle. The instruments are purely digital. We've got the A110 Legend uh, logo on the left and a top down of the car and the car's mileage, or kilometerage, on the right-hand side. This is a French car originally, so everything is 
well, in kilometers and left-hand drive, as you may well have noticed. Fire the car up and we get our rev counter on the left-hand side. Lovely exhaust note there. And our speedometer on the right-hand side and everything else is a digital version of the real thing. So we've got our, our fuel, our exterior temperature. I've got a clock up there. I imagine you can change all of these things around to whatever you prefer. Below that's a little tiny uh, light up screen for warning lights, got the handbrake on at the moment. And moving back from there, we've got our Renault part spin indicator and wiper stalks. Um, the radio controls notably and the phone controls are mostly down here. So you can do it on the screen, but it's a bit of a faff. And we've got flappy paddles because it's a flappy paddle type gearbox in this car. The steering wheel is really rather nice. It's heavily sculpted. It's shaped so you can get your hand on it in a good position for rapid driving. We've got this blue ring at the top matching the contrast stitching, which shows a straight ahead point on the wheel. We've got satin inserts, we've got cruise control controls, we've got our centre section with the anodised metal A for the logo of the car, and we've got a horn, horn test. Ooh, a lightweight up harp. More anodised, flat bottom, and a sport button, and I'm told the sport button is essential. Oh, you hear that note change in the exhaust then? The sport button is essential, I'm told, by the owner, because otherwise the steering is just horrible. Real difference in that normal sport. Interesting, okay, let's fire this down again. Moving across to the right hand side, we've got most displays here on this screen, um, which is not something I'm particularly a big fan of. It's great for keeping the dashboard uncluttered, but not great for finding things easily. I want to turn the car radio down because it's annoying me. I don't like Michael Bublé or something. Oh, how do I do it quickly? I can use this little button down here, or I can go and tap the screen and get the volume control on a slider on there, which if we've got a slight damp or dry hands, it won't work. But anyway, that's kind of annoying. <laughs> So, ignoring that, everything else in the car is inside this, frankly, slow-reacting touchscreen. So, this screen, for example, has been set up as our coolant temperature and our turbo pressure. It doesn't swipe. Horsepower intake temp, a whole bunch of bar graphs showing what things are going on. The kind of stuff that you would basically crash if you tried to watch when you were driving. Uh, information about the gearbox. Where's the clutch, for example? Anyway, underneath that we've got a few essential controls. Uh, auto stop start and traction control on off, hazard warning lights, central locking, and one that looks like a switch but actually isn't because there's something on the top of the range car, which we haven't got, that's annoying. Underneath that is a big vents for the air conditioning, and then beneath that we have got our actual air conditioning. It's only a single zone, it does look quite cool though, with this, all the details, the, the lights and the numbers hidden behind the clear front and the uh, satin silver plastic knurled shaped ring. Looks really cool. And our controls for the fanner on the right hand side. Coming back from that, we've got lots of carbon fibre, lots of leather slash leatherette. We have got a handy slot just there so you can lose your mobile phone in there, keep that nice and safe, not rattling around when you're driving because as you notice, there are no door pockets or indeed cup holders. There is a zero cup holder policy in this car as far as I can tell so far. Stepping back from there, we have got our gear shift is just like on an Aston Martin, just drive, neutral, reverse, push buttons, nothing more than that. That's your full level of control. Window switches here in the center as well. More carbon fiber, engine start, stop, big red button for that. And an electronic handbrake. And finally buttons, which I think are for cruise control. Beneath that we have got dual USBs and an SD card slot in this big open area. And although you can't really see it, there is another Alpine logo in there. And that is all surrounded by what looks like brushed aluminium down there. Feels like it too. Now the seats are quite impressive numbers. These are made by Sabelt. This is not the same brand as the rest of the Renault RS range, but these were significantly lighter. They are a very lightweight, buckety thing. We've got the Alpine, We've got the Alpine name in that centre section. We have got the, the cutout here, so if you uh, had race harnesses, they could come through there. Got more of that diamond stitching. It's very, very soft. Lovely feeling, actually. More cross stitching. And then, that's kind of it. 
Now, because it is a sports car, the, the ceiling is pretty low. The entire car is pretty low, so that's to be expected. Uh, but it does not feel particularly cramped. I've been in, as I say, I've been in the A110 and A310, and they feel a lot smaller than this. This is actually quite nice to be in. Looking back, we have got a single cup holder. Well, there it is. Had to be one somewhere. Another tiny cubby hole, a 12 volt socket down there. And behind us, we have got a little tiny locker, just uh, almost velcroed to the back and held shut with a popper. That's quite fun. And behind us, we've got a glass screen which leads out to the engine. Cool. Right, my first drive in the new, well, this is a 2020, but it's been out since 2017, A110. Now, rear visibility is not fantastic, I have to say. That tiny letterbox of a rear window does not make going backwards easy. It's very low and those are harsh speed bumps. Right. It's just typical of one of the cars I've been looking forward to driving for so long. And I'm here on a day when it's absolutely tipping with rain. Right, so that's sport button. Change the exhaust note. And away we go. Oh, a lovely crackle from the exhaust. Oh, it sounds amazing. They only did warn me to keep it in sport mode because the steering really does weight up nicely in, uh, in sport mode, whereas in regular mode, oh God, it is soft. That's, that's all over the place. So you change lanes across four lanes of motorway if you're not careful um, driving with that, not in sport mode. You do need that on. Now, Renault may have left it almost too long to re, uh, reimagine, bring back the Alpine name because for so long it was a legend among sports car lovers. The first one was the A110 from the 60s, then there was the A310 from the 70s, then there was the A610. But there hasn't been an Alpine product for over two decades, I think, at the time this came out. So really was long overdue. That does mean younger buyers might not even be aware of what the Alpine name means or is. It's just a random name they plucked because it sounds nice. But it's not, it's a name with heritage. It's, it's the French Lotus in many ways. So it does have enormous shoes to fill. Now the last Alpine I drove before this was an A310. And I have to say that was possibly the best car I've ever driven. It almost didn't need a steering wheel because it was basically telepathic, it was so good. So this has got huge shoes to fill. Now, it does feel a lot more modern, obviously that goes without saying. The suspension does feel very hard indeed. That's what you expect, and in many ways, what you actually want. Yeah, the steering is mind-blowingly sharp. Oh, a fit of Barquetta, hello. Also a left-hand drive sports car out in the rain. Now in this current guise, there's one body style, two engine tunes and three trim levels. And that's your lot. They don't give you a lot of chances to mess around and get it wrong. Now the ethos behind this car was simply keep it as light as possible. This goes back to Colin Chapman's ethos of keep it light, stupid. Although I'm not quite sure that's exactly how he phrased it. So everything on this car, has been made to be as light as humanly possible. They've done things like going to the uh, component manufacturers and having them integrate parts into other parts so that there are two parts instead of three. They had uh, ECUs integrated into other ECUs. Oh, very soft on speed bumps. So there are less electronic units around the car. Everything has been done to shave grams here and there. Overall, the car only weighs 1,098 kilos. It is an absolute featherweight. It's all aluminium construction and it is amazing. And that means they can do a lot of things, a lot like with the original M MX-5, in fact. That means that they don't have to have a huge engine. They're not trying to deal with a lot of weight to be controlled. They can have narrower tires, better feel. 
and that means they can get away with a 1.8 litre turbo four-cylinder petrol. And that 1.8 litre engine is tuned to two different levels, either 248 horsepower in the base model or 296 in the GT or S trims. But if you go for the S model, it becomes more track focused, bigger brakes, uh, roll bars, that kind of stuff. But you kind of don't need that because the ethos of the car is light and simple. And uh, it kind of works well in that light, simple format. Now the elephant in the room for me is very much there's nothing here in the middle. It's all just those three buttons and the flappy paddles. And I'm not, as you may well know, a big fan of that. Whenever I talk about this, people say, oh, you're talking about a Mercedes or a Rolls Royce or a Jaguar. You should be happy with an automatic. It suits the character of the car. And yeah, I'm not happy with it, but I can kind of accept that. But when you've got an actual sports car, the argument falls flat, like an MX-5 with an automatic would be absolutely dreadful. And just pootling around the town, as we are at the moment, I'm already getting frustrated with it because it's boring. This chassis is incredibly lithe. The engine is brisk, the steering's alive, the chassis is amazing, but there's no interaction. You can use your flappy paddle things, but that just feels like you're playing a computer game. It doesn't feel like you're really driving a car. I have them in my own car and I virtually never use them because it just feels like nonsense. Now, visibility is quite tight because that roof line is so low and you've got very little sight out the back of the car. I love this crackle, that does sound absolutely phenomenal. is nice to be in but yeah the gearbox does kill it for me so anyway yeah this car is built in Dieppe in the old Alpine Alpine factory yeah, I'm gonna get shouted at whichever way I say it so I'm just gonna stick with Alpine and that's built alongside the RS models the Clio and the Megan so it's Renault's kind of performance hub if you like and they've got a lot riding on it. It's very much the halo model of the range. You can tell that there is a lot of Renault parts bin stuff in and around the vehicle, like the indicator stalks, this radio thing. Um, I know <laughs> the owner was having some trouble with the uh, heated seats the other day. It turned out to be a Dacia part. Oh, there are some big puddles out today. <laughs> the kind of puddle that would knock a GoPro off the side of a car. In terms of performance and rivals, this thing is really pitched against stuff like the, the Porsche Cayman and the Audi TT RS. But it does have a fight on its hands because it's not quite as fast, not to 60 as four and a half seconds, whereas the German rivals are about three and a half. And they do have a certain, I don't know, a tactile quality advantage when it comes to the interior fit and finish. And French cars aren't exactly renowned for their build quality and reliability. That noise does make up for an awful lot, and the fact that this car just feels so much more alive in your hands than those heavier German rivals, if you're really into driving, that'll make a big difference to your buying decisions. It does slingshot amazingly, even at low speeds when you've got the engine just running and the turbo kicking in, it just feels amazing. It's a lovely little thrust from the back of the car, rear wheel drive, of course, so. You do feel it. It has got a flat underbelly to make aerodynamics better, and it's got double wishbone suspension. Now the car costs between 47 and 61,000 pounds, which is quite a lot of money, I'm gonna have to say. And does it feel like a 50 or 60,000 pound car? Well, kinda yes and kinda no. I mean, I know that's what these kind of things cost these days, but in my imagination, in my head, stuck in probably the 1990s, I'm still thinking this is gonna be about 30 grand. Now, I'll be honest, it does not feel as alive as the previous generations, the older generations from the 60s and 70s did. They had a certain weightless charm, an electric connection between your brain and the car. Honestly, I think it's entirely the gearbox. There's just like a synthetic feel to the, the pulling the paddles. It doesn't feel like I'm really doing something. Everything else in this car is just absolutely magnificent. So good and so connected. I love it. I love the chassis. I love the steering. Only in sport mode. Turning uh, 
back into regular mode, it's actually kind of scary. I'm not going to do that anymore. That's, that's really bad. Um, it does feel blisteringly quick off the line. It is quite an impressive feat of engineering, and I love so much about this car. It's a car that I had actually really rather wanted quite a lot. Um, do I still want, do you know what, I'm not, actually not sure. I love so much about it, I just don't enjoy the lack of interaction. It is a seven speed dual clutch gearbox, which is, I'm sure, a masterpiece of uh, modern technology, but it does fly in the face of the keeping everything light philosophy because it's quite a lot heavier than just putting a basic manual gearbox and a clutch in there. You can't really see very much down the front of the car because it slopes away so dramatically. Everything's behind you, really. And it is very cool looking in the mirror and seeing those big flared arches just out behind you. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this ride out in this superb little French nugget of joy. It's been a long held ambition to drive one of these cars and it's not been disappointing, but it has once again shown that I do think putting an automatic in a sports car is a disappointing fail. It would be so much better with a manual in it. And the steering, although it's incredibly sharp in sport mode, is virtually unusable in standard everyday mode, which does make it feel like a bit of a compromise all the time. That and the gearbox just mean this isn't the car I hoped it would be. Thank you for watching, I hope you've enjoyed. If you have, like and subscribe and join me again next time driving something completely different.